recording. So hopefully the um, video lectures from last time weren't too hard to follow or whatever. Um, I was doing it from my Airbnb in, in DC. Oh, get that off. This thing like pops up all the time. I don't know how to make it stop. Just started. But so today we're going to kind of continue that discussion. There's kind of three aspects. There's I want to talk a little bit more about core formation. I could have just added this in, but it felt like it was starting to get too long. So I'm going to kind of summarize it. And I think the two things we're interested in is how did the core forming affect the composition of the mantle? Because we use the composition of the mantle and um, especially the trace elements in it to understand things about whole earth processes, you know, hot spots, arc volcanism, et cetera. And so we need to understand on what we call the primitive mantle, the imprint of the core forming, what was stripped out, for instance, and when. And then I'm going to try to summarize, you know, everything that we talked about with respect to earth accretion already. And it's just like a slide, but I just thought I would highlight it just to kind of help put stuff in context, right? We have a condensation sequence, we start to build stuff up. At some point we segregate a core, and then we've got a system with a core and a mantle. And then the next questions will be, so when did the moon form? And when did the crust form? And this topic four is going to spill in the next time. We'll talk really specifically about the continental crust and the oceanic crust. But um, it's really interesting to me, at least, because all these things are happening simultaneously. <clears throat> so the Earth is really changing a lot in, um, in those sort of first few hundred million years of its history. All right, so this is kind of an image I took. It's one view of how core formation happened, right? You've seen various things. We, and I talked about it in the video lecture about how do we have enough heat to melt the core uh, or melt the material that segregates to the core? Does it have a contaminant in it like oxygen or sulfur or something like that that lowers the melting point? And then the question is, is how, how does it separate from the solid silicate material of the earth, which we assume is kind of chondritic? Does it percolate grain by grain or does it segregate in bigger layers and uh, sink down to the center of the earth? And this process of liquid uh, molten iron kind of interacting with silicate crystals is important for understanding the chemistry of what's in the core and what's left behind in the mantle. Because we have to ask ourselves, even if we understand the process of which this happened, was our chemical equilibrium? So we're going to go through some steps now. You know, what we've already sort of decided from last time is, is that the composition of what we call the siderophile elements in the mantle are not as low as we would expect from like a total solid silicate metal equilibrium. So it could be like a kinetic thing, or it could be that the metal phase, the core was contaminated, or um, there are various other possibilities as well, such as somehow when the core formed, the liquid didn't touch all the mantle, right? It just touched part of it, and then the mantle stirred up. And in any event, somehow the siderophile elements are anywhere between five and 350 times more enriched in the mantle. And we'll talk about how we learn that in a second um, by looking at rock samples. But they're more enriched than we would expect for like a total equilibrium between silicate and iron. And when we look at the center file elements, they're also volatile. Remember the condensation sequence, the ones that don't really condense until whatever 600 uh, degrees or less. And there are some center files in that category. They are even less depleted or another way to say that it is even more enriched in the silicate mantle than we would expect. So if you think about it, it's like, okay, somehow some part of the material that created with the chondritic earth didn't get into the core, and it, even though it likes to go into the core because it's serophile, and the, the subclass of those is kind of volatile, even less likely. And it's hard to have a process do this. And so you'll see what they end up having to do to explain this away uh, at the end. And there's also the chalcophile elements, right? Those are the sulfur loving elements. Those are mostly found today in the mantle and Earth's crust, the lower crust. But, um, you know, what we find in them is, is that they, they're depleted relative to chondrites, um, but again, not as depleted as many serophiles. So um, if you think about it, what I said in the last, in the video lecture is like, well, one possibility people talk about is that you contaminated the core with some sulfur, right? And if that helped lower the melting point of the iron to move it down, it's one of the potential light elements. But if sulfur were in the core, it would strip the chalcophile elements out. So it, this is kind of the reason why 
we rule out much sulfur in the core. We think the light elements are primarily oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, silicon, as I kind of talked about last time. So this is a plot. It's a little bit complicated, um, but it basically shows you as a function of the temperature of condensation, right? So, so a volatile element and a refractory element on this side, and then measuring the concentration in the silicate part of the earth, or what we sometimes call PMM for primitive mantle, um, relative to C1 chondrite, right? So if it's the same in chondrite, you're gonna get a ratio of one. So look it up here, you can see all these refractory elements that are also not lithophile, they are at a concentration of one. This is how we kind of know that the mantle is chondritic. And you can kind of look over here at what the symbols are. In essence, what this plot tells us is here are the highly serophile elements. They're depleted. They're not as depleted as experiments would suggest they should be, but they're really depleted, you know, by more than, um, you know, they're less than a percent of what they would be before the core forms. The refractories are all there, the lithophile refractories. And then these other elements, kind of decrease on this complicated trend where they get lower and lower as the temperature goes down, lower and lower from what uh, we would expect. So we understand it was a hot process and there was some volatility, but um, you know why is there kind of such a, such a big spread here? And, and part of the reason for that, as we'll see, is the complications of kind of how the core formed, when the core formed, how complete the equilibrium was, because there's a log scale. So there's a big, big variation there. So there's three ways we can learn this. One is we can actually get samples of the mantle, right? That, it's kind of hard to do now, four and a half billion years after the Earth formed to try and find some primitive mantle, but you can do it. And where we get samples of the mantle is xenoliths in a lot of things, right? But xenoliths um, mostly, like the xenoliths that you find here at Salt Lake Crater, they're of the super shallow mantle that's already been processed a bunch of times. They don't really tell us about the first original mantle. So, but if you could go back and find like an ancient lava flow from early in Earth's history and it has a xenolith in it and somehow in four and a half billion years or whatever, it hasn't been altered, right? By weathering and all that kind of junk, right? So it's pretty rare, but it has happened. Then there's these two, what I call indirect methods. So one of them is to just find some really old lava and measure the concentration of the siderophile elements. Problem is, is that as we'll talk about in coming weeks, when we do um, melting, partial melting of the mantle to make a rock, whether it's with a salt or some other composition, we change, we rearrange all the chemical elements in the periodic chart. So we have to apply like a melting model. We have to understand a ton about the conditions under which that magma was produced, such as how oxidized or reduced was it? Um, how deep was it? There's a whole bunch of stuff. So this is kind of complicated. So the preferred method is this other thing, which is used to some kind of geochemical trickery, basically, which is, we look at a ratio of elements in an old lava that's invariant um, to melting processes. I mean, we take two elements that have two different properties, but during melting of the mantle, they behave the same, if that makes sense. That's what we call them an invariant ratio. So when we suck them off the mantle, they don't change their ratio. And there are certain elements that, and as I say, we'll talk about how we know this later, but for now, you're just gonna have to trust me on that. But in this invariant ratio, one of the two elements is siderophile, and one of the two elements is not siderophile and it's refractory. Okay, and so if you go back up to this chart that I was showing you, it's one of these guys up here in this category. Something that we can hang our hat on and say, yeah, we know that when Earth formed, uh, it made a primitive mantle with a kind of a bulk chondritic composition, and we find plenty of refractory elements like the rare earths and aluminum and zirconium and so forth, that um, and uranium and thorium as well are, are totally. Um, still there in the right proportion. Okay, so we take these things and then we do some other fancy footwork from that ratio to figure out the absolute concentration. Now, I've kind of described it here on a couple of, um, of slides um, that we'll look at next. And I will just say that of these three uh, processes, this indirect number two is the most precise, is how most of the data on that diagram I was just showing you was derived. And one of the parts about this that, uh, and we'll talk about this, we've already talked about it, but we'll keep talking about it um, as we go into igneous processes, is the use of a Henry's Law constant, right? A Henry's Law constant for the production of a melt from solids is basically written as the distribution coefficient of chemical A is the concentration of A in the solids divided by the concentration of A in the melt, <clears throat> okay? And this assumes A is a trace element, okay? 
Another kind of important thing here is that it says the modal concentration of A in the solids. Are, are you guys familiar with that term? Modal? It's basically, if you have a solid phase, like a, a rock or the mantle, and it's got a bunch of different minerals in it, then it's the weighted proportion of the elements in each one of those solids. So like if you had a, a rock that had sort of equal amounts of olivine, clinopyroxene, and orthopyroxene, then you would basically just do the arithmetic sum of the individual element concentrations. But you know, you can account for all sorts of different percentages if you want. Um, you know, a rock that has a rare amount of some phase might control the concentration of some. But the important thing is that for invariant ratios, this thing is, is basically the ratio of kgs of different elements is one. This is what we call the partition coefficient. It's what decides from an individual element and an individual assemblage of solids whether it wants to go into the melt or the solid. And so if two elements have the same value of this number, then they're not going to separate from each other when melting happens. <clears throat> okay, so we want to have that. We also want to look at what we call incompatible elements. Incompatible elements are elements that don't want to stay in the solid. They want to go into the melt. And so that, that way we find more of them in the magma that came off the mantle than the mantle that formed them. And that means that they have a low value of this distribution coefficient or partition coefficient. That should be less than one. <clears throat> Those are the elements that are easiest um, to understand. <clears throat> so the other thing that we do, you know, is pick ratios that work for us, as I kind of alluded to before. So we find elements that behave similarly. So, um, you know, one of them is uranium and potassium, right? We talked about this with planetary surfaces. Uranium and potassium, when they're sucked off the mantle or the mantle of another planet like the moon, or body, I should say, celestial body, uh, they aren't fractionated from each other. So the ratio we find in a lunar mare basalt or basalt on Earth is approximate. I put the approximate equal here, but it's you know, close enough for government work, the same concentration ratio as the mantle, right? And so we use that to basically say, okay, if the mantle that produced the lava flow didn't separate these things and we see variation in these things between different lavas, it must be something else. And in that case, we were using the, the, the fact that potassium is really volatile in the uranium is not. So that was like a planetary surface thing. For the mantle, for the siderophile thing, we're doing something different. We're taking the element molybdenum, which is a siderophile element, and the element neodymium, which is one of those refractory elements. It's at one in the primitive male. And we look at the ratio of those two things so that the molybdenum to neodymium ratio in a basalt that came off the mantle should be about the same as the molybdenum neodymium ratio. The difference is that this is a refractory and this is a siderophile element. So something about what formed the mantle will be recorded in that ratio. And the uh, final thing we need to know is sort of like, what was the original refractory element concentration of the mantle? We could make that estimate directly with neodymium, but it's a trace element. And it's possible to have a little trace phases in there that make it complicated to get a good value off of it. So instead, we use the aluminum concentration. So aluminum is another refractory element, right? It's part one of the main elements in the CAIs. We know the neodymium aluminum ratio in chondrites really well. So we just assume that that is the ratio for the early mantle because it's two refractory elements, okay? And so we're going to use the neodymium, the aluminum, and the molybdenum concentration together to come back out to an absolute concentration of molybdenum in the mantle by taking this ratio of the basalt, which is really this ratio of the primitive mantle, this ratio in chondrites, an estimate of aluminum in the mantle, which we talked about a couple of times ago. It's a, it's a pretty robust estimate that we have. And that will tell us the molybdenum concentration in the primitive mantle. And so we make these calculations for all the various elements we can, and that's how we end up with a chart like that. You know, you know, and it's got some uncertainties. I don't want to, you know, make it seem like it's all, you know, perfect, but it works pretty well, certainly within orders of magnitude well. And so we can make the same kind of arguments, for instance, with uranium um, by uh, an aluminum instead of using neodymium and putting the element tungsten in instead of molybdenum. So what you'll see is that for that chart I just showed you, the element we compare it to might differ because we're looking for something with the same behavior during melting of the salt. And this is basically how we build that fat chart up. Okay, and so there, there are some um, results on the next slide. It's a little bit hard to talk through it because it's written out, but you know, these elements are molybdenum and tungsten are considered moderately siderophile. And these concentrations that we find now are somewhere in between what we would expect a complete molten iron segregation uh, equilibrium and no equilibrium. 
this is part of that idea that I'm saying where there's somehow more of these things left in the mantle than there should be if the core managed to percolate through and touch every grain. Okay. And so, and which is kind of summarized here. Um, and one group of elements is really useful for this are what we call the PGEs or platinum group elements, right? Because they're highly synergical. So if we come down and we look at this plot again, many of these elements in here are PGEs, okay? Uh, rhenium is also considered a PGE, but the platinum group elements all kind of sit down here. So here's platinum, right? There's gold, there's rhenium, here's osmium. This whole group is really serifal. They're not like going into the middle. Okay. And so when we look at them, it's like, well, they should be totally stripped out. And they are really low, but they're not as low as we would expect. Okay. And among the equally center file elements, if we compare two elements that have the same equilibrium concept to go from silicate into iron, the ones of those that are more volatile than other ones, which are just called Y and X, just to sort of help make it uh, be able to write an expression out, are even more enriched. So if you think about it, you got this liquid iron, it's percolating through the silicate now, stripping stuff out. Somehow, it doesn't fully strip out the center files, and even somehow weirder, the elements that are part of that system that are more volatile, comparatively, are even less stripped out. So the, pretty much the only way we can figure out how to do this is to make the core and then add some more stuff afterward. That's basically the gist of it. Accrete some more chondritic material after the fact and then stir it into the mantle it is sort of the, the gist of it. And so, and I have kind of, um, you've know, gone through some more sophisticated arguments here that I'm going to kind of um, slip through, but you know, basically incomplete equilibration, some surf elements were added, which is what we think actually happened when the molten iron wasn't pure. And as I kind of alluded to last time, and as we just went through in the discussion, there where is some other stuff in the mantle, we know this because of the seismic properties and so forth, um, that isn't iron. And whatever that is does affect how the other elements partition in. But people have by now done the experiments with all the other things. Like they, in a lab, they've made high pressure mixtures of silicate and molten iron. They have a little bit of oxygen in the iron, a little bit of carbon, a little bit of hydrogen, a little bit of silicon, a little bit of sulfur. So we kind of know what it is. And none of them really work as them, like sort of to give us the right ratio of stuff left behind in the course form. This is why we think it's this. Um, and this is just a diagram with a bunch of elements. I realize they're kind of small, but it's vanadium, niobium, manganese, gallium, indium, zinc, chromium, and tantalum. And these are elements that, for instance, these are plotted against mole fraction of sulfur added to the iron phase as you were, like these are experiments. And so you can see here some of these elements, like this one, doesn't really care how much sulfur there is, right? It's, it doesn't, this value of distribution into the core doesn't change. Here's, here's an element that does, right? But so, as I say, we would expect to see, for instance, the indium and the zinc, which don't really show much effect, um, you know, might behave differently than some of the other elements um, and that do show an effect, and yet we don't see that. So this is how we kind of rule out the, uh, the sulfur, okay? So instead, I think, you know, what, what people have kind of come to the idea is, is that, um, core formation finished before accretion was complete, right? And we talked about last time, core formation had to be pretty fast anyway to be able to get the amount of heat, um, which we needed some of the heat to come from radioactive decay. It couldn't all just come from collisional energy. Um, and so you make the bulk of the core really early. And as we're going to see in a second, the event that made the moon also happened really early in Earth's history. And we think we already had a core when the moon was formed. And that's why the moon has so little core in it. So, Basically, we've got really fast, rapid core formation, which also makes sense from the perspective that we have stony iron meteorites, we have iron meteorites, we know that even asteroids have segregated uh, iron spaces. In it. So that's all kind of copacetic. And in this model, people think about roughly what works mathematically is to build up the mantle to about 90% of its size, then make the core, and then add some more stuff. And so this is where, if you remember in the last in one or two video lectures, I said we use a 90-10 model for making so-called pyrolyte, that's where that comes from. It's basically this evidence about the core. So there's like a lot of stuff that works together. There's some other stuff that argues for something called a late veneer, meaning about 10% of Earth's uh, accretion happened after the core formation, but then after that, a little bit more chondritic material was added um, 
in a slightly different way that was less processed. It was added to now. It has to do with kind of the ratio of some of the really volatile things, especially um, and, and oxidation state uh, that we expect for the carbon and the hydrogen system. And it's, um, you know, the arguments are a little bit sophisticated, but this is kind of a summary of what we think happened during accretion. Largely homogeneous, up to 90% of its mass. It happened really fast. Then the core forms, and we strip stuff out. There was maybe some kind of contaminant in there because we know the core has some contaminant in it. Um, then the rest of um, the earth is accreted, another 10%. And there's like a little bit more core formation that happens in that process, right? Not very much, it's just a few percent of core, but this is kind of like tuning the knobs to try and make all the center files work right. And this composition is a little bit different than this one. It's got a little bit less contaminant. And then you have this so-called late veneer of chondritic material that is primarily used to kick up the concentration of volatile elements. Okay, so now our next topic for today is the formation of the moon, which I don't know, I always find this really fascinating, uh, just personally. So here's some stuff about our moon, which you know maybe you already know, but, or maybe you haven't thought about, but it's really large for a planetary satellite relative to the planet. It's in a really weird orbit, right? It's inclined relative to the, very dramatically relative to the plane that we orbit the sun on. It's got a lot of angular momentum in the earth moon system because they, they orbit with each other. Um, and it preserves more angular momentum relative to the planet than other satellite systems, which kind of goes along with number one because of its high mass. It's way more dense than most moons, right? We, and I'll show you a diagram of this, but it's, it's more like a stony planet in terms of its chemical properties. Um, and it has essentially none of the ice components, which I mentioned last week. And it's really similar to Earth composition in some respect to not all. So here's a plot that shows you radius and density. And you'll see here there's a main trend with most of the moons in our solar system. And this, for instance, this density of about one can be accomplished by taking about 60% of the silicate, um, excuse me, 60% uh, of ice and 40% silicate components of the condensate sequence. That's this upper line. This lower line is 100% ice. So you can see how low density those guys are. Now I look at our moon, it's similar, not exactly, but similar in density to Mars, Venus, and Earth. There's two other moons in our solar system that fit up in this category as well, Io and Europa. So we think they also form by different processes than these other processes that form most of the moons of Saturn, for instance. And so the way you might remember back to last week when we were talking about this, or it was actually the week before, um, but one of the ways you can make these subtle differences between the rocky planets is how much iron you cram into their core. Because iron is really dense, it's about eight for the phase. So just changing that amount but having basically the same material that's been devolatilized make all these bodies kind of make sense. And in, the, in that category, the moon would have less core than these other planets, which we have evidence for. We, we know that's the case from moonquakes. And this is basically, so during, uh, especially during the Apollo program, seismometers were left there um, and um, measurements of sort of, you know, seismic velocities within the moon, just like it's happened on Earth, reveal kind of thickness of the crust, an upper and lower mantle with the phase changes like we have um, on Earth, and then a really small core, okay? Way smaller than the core on Earth. It's thought to be only, you know, like two to 4% of the mass. And that works with the, you know, relative to Earth, where it's more like a third of our mass, that works with making that density difference. So, you know, we don't know that much about this core, right? We're assuming it's iron, primarily like the iron that's in our core, plus minus. Uh, we don't know if there's any molten part of it. We do know that the moon has a small magnetic field, and the magnetic field comes from the liquid part of our core. But, um, you know, we, we don't really know the details. We just know it's really small. So that's a key part. We also have samples that were returned. So this is a map of the, the you know, side of the moon facing us. And this is a composition, uh, average composition of basalts that were collected on those various missions and brought back to Earth. And so this is sort of where those all went. It's Apollo, you know, Surveya Luna, and um, I don't know how you pronounce that one, but these are, you know, uh, various other uh, unmanned probes that went, went to the moon. And so you can see here kind of, here's the bulk Earth, here's the bulk moon, 
This is the silicate part, meaning just take out the core, basically, um, and which bumps up these concentrations. But what you'll see, if you look across, um, so when we look in bulk, these ratios, all these things look really different because there's so much um, you know, less iron in the core of the moon than there is on Earth. So if we just convert to looking at the silicate portion, you'll see if these things are pretty similar for some elements. You know, for silicon, they're basically the same. For magnesium, a little bit more magnesium on Earth, but they're basically the same. But there's some elements, like look at potassium, that's different by a factor of 30, right? As we talked about last time, that's because it was a hot process. And when the moon was being formed, we think most of the potassium and a significant amount of the sodium were volatilized out into space. They didn't like reaccrete. Um, we can do better than that by looking at more compositional characteristics. And so um, when we kind of sum up everything, which is on this slide, the Earth and the Moon look similar in bulk element composition when we account for the difference um, in proportional core. They have basically the same oxygen isotope. I didn't really emphasize this before, but most of the materials in our solar system have similar oxygen isotope compositions for the radius from the sun that they accreted in. So there's a variation as you go out. There are um, also processes that happen at low temperature and early on in our nebula that give us some oxygen isotopic heterogeneity, we think, uh, going all the way back to the last nucleosynthetic event. But at least for the Earth Moon system, they basically look like they condense from the same material from an oxygen isotopic uh, perspective. And then when we look at the moon, the things that are different are, you know, there's way less iron on the moon. There's way less siderophile elements. It, you know, using that same method that we just talked about for estimating those elements in our, our own mantle, we can do that for these things, right? We can take the uh, gallium, the, actually, the gallium and the germanium ratio compared to something else like neodymium um, or uranium that's refractory, and then we can estimate their concentrations. It's got way less of the moderately volatile elements, especially the alkaline metals, which are you know moderately volatile. It's got way, way less of the really volatile elements, which are things like bismuth, lead, and arsenic. Um, and yet there's more of the refractory elements, especially aluminum, calcium, and titanium, the stuff that makes up the CAI inclusions and chondrites. And the way I think about this is, this is like the stuff is left behind. Once it condenses into chondrites, it's really hard to make it go away. It's not volatile. It doesn't go into the core. It just stays with the silicate residue. So whenever we find these elements high, it means everything else is low. And that just leaves a higher proportion of them left. So this is a plot showing you the moon relative to C1 chondrites, right? And I hope, hopefully you've gotten used to it, but I'm using these kind of plots a lot um, because we think that the parent material in a homogeneous accretion scenario was chondritic, whether it was C1 or C3 or some average of chondrites is kind of neither here nor there. We get the basic picture that some elements are the same, the refractory elements and other elements are lesser as a function of how siderophile or how volatile they are. Um, this is a comparison of the moon to the earth. Maybe it's a more straightforward one, but we can see here that, for instance, most of our um, refractory elements are the same. There's slightly higher amounts of these siderophile elements, chromium and manganese, slightly less sulfur and selenium. And then as we go down, Again, there's lower concentration of volatile and siderophile elements. And this is just a plot of the oxygen isotopic point I was making on the last slide as well, which is, is that um, chondrites show kind of a variation pattern, which has to do with where they condense relative to um, the kind of radius from the sun. So this is the delta oxygen 18 and the delta oxygen 17. 17 is that kind of minor isotope, both of these relative to oxygen 16. And here's the terrestrial lunar trend. So these things kind of um, follow their own separate trend, and, and yet they're, they're consistent with um, isotopic heterogeneity that comes from fractionation by you know, separating things out from a common reservoir. But that reservoir, while it intersects this curve, all those materials, if, if they came from different kinds of materials that we might expect to see more scatter, they wouldn't be on a single line. So here's the hypotheses for making the moon. They're kind of illustrated in this diagram and they're written out here. One of them is like, oh yeah, somehow the earth just blurped out a moon, right? Which that's what they call the, you know, auto fishing. And uh, unlikely, right? Um, but that's what's kind of shown here. It's, it's my favorite graphic of, of the four. Um, 
then we have a separate condensation near Earth, right? Like the condensation is happening or homogeneously accreting, and somehow we make two things and they never collide with each other. It's possible, right? It does explain the fact that the compositions are the same, but it's kind of hard to do in, a, in an area of space where there's a whole bunch of stuff hitting each other. How, how would that happen, right? Um, and um, this one I accidentally skipped, which was extraterrestrial object capture, which is like, eh, there was some other thing floating around like an asteroid, somehow came near Earth and we just grabbed it. It can happen, but it's really hard to do physically, the, you know, to, to get it to come into the orbit that it's in and with its angular momentum and all that kind of stuff. Pretty hard. Um, plus the fact, why would it be compositionally so similar to Earth if it was just some random thing? So this is the one that people basically agree on, which is called forced fission which basically means instead of spontaneous fission, something hit the earth and spit it out the other side, okay? And that's basically the giant impact hypothesis. People even named the impact, they call it Theia, okay? And the thing about it is that when Theia hit earth, earth was smaller than it is now, and Theia was bigger than Mars. So this wasn't like some tiny little deal. This was like a huge monster thing that came and impacted earth. But it, in people have modeled how this probably happened. It hit in a glancing blow, right? And so that body was accreted to Earth and it spit some other stuff out the other side, which condensed to make the move. And if it only impacted the silicate part of our Earth after our core had formed, then the stuff that was spit out the other side wouldn't have much iron in it, which is why there's so little iron in the mix, we think, right? And so this is kind of you know what that looks like. There's this big object, it hits the Earth, you know, boom, it, it connects, and then it makes this kind of debris ring around the Earth, which then condenses to make a moon. A kind of short story version of it. Here's like a slightly cooler, more modern graphic, if you will. Um, Earth in the early days, after it had made a core, could have been mostly molten on its surface or molten beneath the surface. If you recall the last time I talked about the deep magma ocean that we think we need to be able to segregate out a core. Um, so if the impact happened during that period of time, you know, and it spits out this thing, and somehow over time that condenses into a moon-sized object that's kind of sweeping through its annulus and cleaning up all the stuff, that's how you kind of end up with the Earth-Moon system. And with the impact, you can do all that funny stuff like the inclined orbit and the high angular momentum and all that kind of stuff. And here's some of the compositional attributes that are so useful um, for kind of helping understand that this was a hot process. So these are the ratios of some of the volatile elements relative to some of the refractory elements. So you can see here I've highlighted potassium, rubidium, and sodium are, the, and we look at the earth to moon ratio, we see the moon has something like a half to maybe two thirds of each one of these elements, right? So it lost, when it formed, when it was spit out, this hot process, it's almost like we did the condensation sequence in reverse, not for the refractory elements, but for the volatile ones. And they didn't manage to end up condensing back onto the, on the you know, in space and interstellar dust, or maybe they created back to Earth. We're not really sure. So, you know, and this describes us a little bit more, you know, that the body was probably called Theia, that, uh, well, the body, the body, the body was called, this is what the people call it, but that the, you know, the body was pretty large. This happened at the late stage of accretion. And, you know, it was moving relatively slowly. This wasn't like so high of an energy impact that it like, you know, obliterated Earth. An object that big today hitting Earth at a high velocity would be done. Um, and this was, I'm sure, catastrophic for the planet, but it didn't break the planet apart, right? It, it allowed it to um, kind of continue on and accrete some of the material and spit some of the material out the other side. And it didn't apparently disrupt our core. So this is a cool little simulation of what that kind of maybe looked like. Um, and, um, you know, basically there's all sorts of simulations like this out there, but kind of showing an object coming in, making a bunch of particulate um, and gas, which then kind of recondenses into the earth moon system. So um, what's interesting is, is that we think that that, the planetary body thing was also differentiated. It already had a core. It already had um, a kind of a more silicate mantle that was stripped of it. And, um, you know, we think that most of the core from Theia, it's not like it just hit Earth and spit out the other side. Most of its core was added to our core. So this was a violent process. It, it required a lot of, um, you know, melting and heat and redistribution of material. 
And it's possible that all that stuff I just told you about our core, like, oh, the seropile element concentrations um, are a little bit complicated. It's possible that the process through which the theta core was formed is different than the process through which our core was formed, and that that um, explains some of those uh, complications in the composition of our um, uh, the seropile elements in our mantle. But I kind of want to remind you that the elements that are most enriched in our mantle relative to the core are the volatile sitophile elements. This process that forms the moon loses volatiles. So again, we can't call on theia. We can call on it for making the moon. We can call on it for affecting some of the composition of Earth, but we can't call on it for adding volatile elements to our mantle because it was added in a hot process and those volatiles would probably be gas in this case. So here's just a little bit more info about the moon. You know, I wish we had more time to talk about it in the class, but we don't. But this is a sort of a timeline of things from, from the text, sort of showing you, you know, you make the moon at around the same time as Earth. You can see here, you know, he's got formation of the moon at the same age as the Earth. We don't think it's the same age as the Earth, but we think that it probably happened within that initial 100 million years of Earth's history, that that's when that theia impact formed. And then you start to differentiate and make a crust, an early proto-crust. And then, and that happens, you know, within the next couple of hundred million years. And then we start to make the Maros, the big flood basalt provinces that we find on this side of the moon facing us. And, uh, and there's always this bombardment happening, right? There's accretion still going on while these are happening, but these, these rocks have been recovered and dated, so we know how old they are. And then at some point, the heavy bombardment ends, right? The big objects kind of stop falling throughout the solar system. But they're recorded better on the moon because it doesn't have any plate tectonics or much late stage volcanism, so it's not obscured. We still see that that difference. And then, you know, starting in uh, roughly three billion years ago, pretty much nothing's been happening. There's just, you know, kind of cratering from impacts and regolith, which is the soil on the moon or the particulate material that covers the moon, is continually being formed and modified by interaction with infalling particles and, and cosmic rays coming off the sun. <clears throat> but so. There's some interesting stuff about, you know, the, the processes through which these basalts are formed and um, what they look like that also give us information about um, the moon. But this is really in stark contrast to the Earth, right? You know, where we know crustal formation has been ongoing, partly because of plate tectonics. So <clears throat> whatever it is that allows our planet to retain enough heat, probably through, you know, some combination of um, the original heat the uh, heat generated from the gravitational collapse as well as radioactive decay allows us to, our metal to kind of keep churning and keep supporting volcanism or it doesn't happen here. And it doesn't happen as far as we know on Mars, but maybe a little bit lo longer than on the moon, but not for very long. So uh, <clears throat> within the lunar crust, there are basically three kinds of rocks. There are these mare basalts, and I'm not counting the regolith, that's, that's almost like um, you know, alluvium in a way. And then we have um, another kind of basalt, which is really enriched in potassium and the rarefied elements. These guys down here, which are sometimes abbreviated the REE, so and phosphorus. So we would call these things pre basalts, just them for potassium, rarefied, and phosphorus. Um, and one of the interesting things about it is like, well, how, how do you get that? You know, the mantle must be enriched in those things, but we don't find anything creep like on Earth. Um, there's another kind of rock which is found in lunar highlands, the stuff that sticks up above the Mare, that are anorthosites. Anorthosites are basically gabbroic, crystal-rich rocks that are very rich in anorthite, which is um, a calcium-rich form of plagioclase, as well as uh, primarily pyroxene and oxides. And so <clears throat> this is a plot of the rare elements organized by atomic number, lanthanum geoturbium, which is basically just um, lanthanum, well, lanthanum is over here, and then and we go along the term, second to last one in the, in the plot. And this is the concentration in lunar rocks, the meaning these mare basalts, the creep things, as well as the anorthosites, relative to chondrites, right? So again, it's a ratio. If, if it was one, it'd be the same as chondrites. Okay, so one is down here, right? And so these anorthosites, these things that are sticking up in the highlands, they're basically chondritic. There's like a slight enrichment here, except the element europium. We'll talk about this um, in coming weeks when we talk about igneous processes. But of all the rare earths, they take a plus three charge, except europium takes a plus two charge. It has to do with its 
uh, partially filled orbital configuration. And so having a different charge allows it to substitute in the flaggy place much better. That's why we have this big positive spike. The fact that we have a positive spike in the anorthosites, which means that they somehow grabbed extra europium during the process in which they were formed, whereas all the creep rocks have a deficit, suggests that they formed as a system that, that was melting. You segregated out the basalt liquid and you had a bunch of crystal rich rock that it turns out is less dense. The northosites can oftentimes be less dense than the basalt that they form from. So you crystallize this stuff and it floats almost like icebergs and then everything freezes and you got your lunar highlands. And um, they can be modeled very straightforwardly the composition of the rare earth elements along with the europium anomaly, we call it, um, helps us understand that these two rocks were probably formed together. We probably have something similar like this on Earth, but it's long since gone. It's all obscured. But this kind of represents the early proto crust, right? And this crust, you know, because there was a lot of volatiles lost when the moon was formed, it's, it's going to be um, more dense than it would have been if the moon had formed in a process that preserved the volatiles, but still less dense than the kind of crust we find on Earth forming today out of the moon. Right, and I'll, I'll kind of go through that again when we talk about the crust. So um, this is just a you know picture of a life pre picture of the moon from um, JPL. But you know the, the summary of this is that the moon was formed you know relatively early during the accretion before uh, the planet was completely accreted, but after our core was formed, it was a hot process, and in many ways we can completely understand both the composition of the silicate mantle of the moon, as well as the processes through which melting happened early on on the moon to make the Mario basalts in the highlands, all in the context of this simple model of making a silicate moon mantle, which is very similar to the silicate earth mantle, minus volatiles and minus acidic volatiles. And then you make basalts through you know, the same mechanism you make them on Earth. And um, so, Having said that, this is my one slide summary of all of the early accretion history of the terrestrial planets from the perspective of um, Earth. We start to build stuff up from the small particles into larger particles, largely homogeneously. Uh, this happens relatively um, rapidly to the point that um, we start to make moon-sized bodies, meaning other bodies in the solar system are about the size of our moon. But once that happens, they start sort of sweeping through the uh, solar system and collecting all the other debris onto them and growing larger in size. And of course, further out, we're creating the gassy planets and, and they have a, a similar process, but they're retaining a lot more gas. And then, um, you know, by comparison, over a process of maybe 10 million years or so, we build up to Earth-like sizes, which you know, sounds long, but in the time scale of, of Earth, it's pretty fast. Right, so, and, we're, and then we're making a core, and then we're having the impact, and all that's pretty much done, um, you know, within maybe 50 to 100 million years of the formation, the, the very first kernels of Earth, right? And so, and, um, you know, when we date the age of the Earth, it's a question of, well, what exactly are we dating? Are we dating the end product? Um, where is the end product? Because, you know, the infalling accretionary material doesn't just stop, it kind of tails off, right? There's still stuff falling to Earth today, right? And officially, accretion is never quite complete. All right. So I don't believe that clock. Let me look at this. Yeah, I guess it is. Okay. So um, now, and for the rest of the time, we're going to talk about the formation of the crust, right? Like, so, oh, when did when crust start forming? Like, we know on the moon, we start making crust really early. We don't have any of that stuff left on Earth. We don't have any 4.4 billion year old crust. We do have, as we'll talk about, some evidence that we had a crust early on, mostly little crystals that are found in other rocks that we think were initially formed in, a, in an early crust. So we kind of want to know, how do we get a crust? What does our crust look like? And how did that evolve into the current modern system, which has uh, oh, two different kinds of crust, right? We have, uh, oh, I know it's plugged in. We have um, oceanic crust and we have continental crust, right? And so, um, cool. How do we get there? And so we're going to talk about that stuff now, and this will continue into next time. Next time we're going to talk more um, gory detail about the crust. But I want to think about the crust from the biggest perspective first. 
And, um, you know, as we said, we're basically talking about what's happening on Earth sort of within this first 50 to 100 million years, um, you know, after the, you know, we're sort of con contemporaneous with core formation, uh, moon formation, and then we kind of stabilize and um, bombardment doesn't end until about 3.9 billion years. That, that's another thing from that moon's uh, time scale slide, heavy bombardment. There's still big stuff coming in, so it's being disrupted, but we're making a crust. And we kind of want to know, what was the early planetary crust like? And is the early planetary crust like the crust we have today, or is it something different? Is it more like the crust that we see on Mars or Venus? We want to know that. We want to know how did it form, and we want to know how has it changed since then. These are sort of the three questions about the crust that we'd like to know. So here's some stuff that I, I the next eight slides I've listed as review, because there's stuff that's talked about in in 101 or other intro geology classes that, oh, and or other of our classes that presumably you've had before. So I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. But remember that we've got two kinds of crust on Earth, basaltic crust, which is more dense, and a granitic crust, which is less dense. It's isostatically compensated, meaning um, the elevations of what we see sticking up from a uniform surface on Earth are compensated with a root underneath, which the less dense the material, the bigger the root needs to be. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about uh, how much of this granitic crust there is and when we think it formed and how it started to accrete. But the basaltic crust being denser is what forms the base of the ocean basins on today's Earth. Okay, the density difference is not huge. You know, the uh, continental crust mean density is about 2.7 grams per cubic centimeters and oceanic crust about 2.8. So it's a small difference, just 0.1, but it makes for really different properties of the crust. So this is um, a diagram showing you the kind of two kinds of crust in relative proportion today on Earth. Okay, so this is a plot of relative area versus elevation relative to a reference point. And on Earth, that reference point is sea level. Um, and you can see here in blue that basically the continents stick up and the ocean basins are low. And there's a range of, of elevations in both of them. But this is a bimodal crustal distribution. And this is shown here again on this hypsometric curve. This is the cumulative amount of crust at different elevations points on Earth. Uh, this is deeper, this is higher, or you know, um, sticking up. And this is where sea level is. And this is the first derivative of that, which is what gives us this curve. Now, if we look at all the other rocky planets in the solar system, as well as the moon, they don't have that. They have a single distribution. Venus, Mars, Mercury, the Moon. So somehow, the fact that we have a continental crust uh, that's less dense than the mean and sticks up high, and an oceanic crust that's more dense than the mean and sticks up low is unique on our rocky planets. Okay. Um, so the other thing we can ask is, well, so you know, what, what do we think the early rock type was? We think it was basalt, probably very similar to what we see on the Moon, right? Given the fact that the silicate now on the moon and silicate now on the earth are very similar. Uh, we do have some evidence of what these early basaltic rock types were like. Um, there's a type of rock called Kamaniite. You may have heard of this before. It's a really high temperature, extensive melt of the mantle compared to modern basalts like we have here in Hawaii. And so how they're primarily manifested is really high concentrations of magnesium, which allow them to precipitate a lot of olivine. So Kamaniites commonly have something called spin effects texture, which is shown here. The picture doesn't show up very well, but with these really long um, olivine crystals that are sort of arranged in um, you know, various kind of beautiful structures. And we find Kamaniites on Earth. We find them especially early on in Earth's history. They require way more heat because we're melting them out more extensively to make them. Okay? And in fact, some types of Kamaniites are associated with diamonds in, uh, for instance, in um, uh, Siberia and in South Africa, parts of the, you know, continental shields where the oldest material is found. But we presume that the vast, vast majority of the early basaltic crusts, including this commandiated component, were resubducted into the mantle. They're gone. We can infer something about that process because there was probably a chemical imprint on the mantle. And we're going to talk about radiogenic isotopes. 
um, and how they play a role in telling us that we had an early crust in a few weeks coming up. Because um, depending on the difference between stable elements and radioactive elements is when you do something um, makes a different signature in the radioactivity. And so um, we know something about the process of early crustal formation because it left an imprint on the mantle in the isotope uh, ratio. <clears throat> but so one interesting thing about these rocks is that you know they, they require a really high temperature, like 1700 degrees. So you know, the salts that we find on Earth now for 1200, 1300, uh, commonly, um, there are some higher temperature rocks that occasionally are found uh, in these rocks today on Earth or in their rock history, but but these kinds of ultramafic lavas are pretty much restricted to early on in Earth history. So this is a map. You've probably seen various maps like this of um, continental crustal ages on the planet and oceanic ages. So the ocean crust ages are various shades of blue, right? Light blue to dark blue. You can see the mid-ocean ridges on here. That's where the crust is the youngest. We have seafloor spreading and the uh, um, crust is getting older as it goes. But the important thing is the oceanic crust is constantly renewing itself on our planet so that the oldest stuff that we have in, in the way this diagram is written out here, it shows greater than 65. The oldest oceanic crust we have is in this part of the Pacific Ocean. It gets up to around 100 million years old, maybe a little bit older. It's young. Now we compare that to the stuff on land, we have really old rocks, right? The oldest rocks being the Archean. I'm going to just blow up. I have a little scale, so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, Archean is in orange, and early Proterozoic is in pink. These are the two oldest time periods on here, and then these younger colors. And what you see, I'll go back to just pull that thing back off the screen for a second, is these areas with orange, that's the oldest stuff, surrounded by areas of pink. And it turns out that we call these cratons or shields. These are the oldest, thickest, coldest parts of the continental crust. We know the continents have come together and broken apart various times in Earth's history. Um, it also turns out that the majority of this stuff is in North America, between North America and Greenland. It's just sort of how it worked out. The next biggest shield is here in kind of central North Europe. There's a pretty big chunk here too in uh, Russia, uh, you know, but not, not so much, especially the orange stuff here, a little bit here, a little bit here. Interestingly enough, I guess because of the conditions that things sit, are sitting in, some of, the, the, some of the oldest rocks that we know of on the planet are from this part of uh, Western Australia, as well as to a lesser extent, um, this part of uh, Western Greenland, even though it, there isn't a lot of it to show up as orange, there are some very old rocks over here as well. And there's some ones here. And then, um, <clears throat> then you see the pink areas around them. Whereas, you know, by comparison, I mean, Africa has got some little dots of it, but they're not in a coherent chunk. It's got a lot of younger material. And uh, I mean, you can see here that a lot of this stuff on a lot of the continents, like all of the Western North America, this is sort of like added later. So it's, it's um, relatively young by comparison. So these, you know, our remnants, there's a continuing rock cycle, breaking and forming rocks and weathering and breaking them down. Um, so we don't kind of want to understand that. We can't just go to today's crust and take samples of it and say, oh, well, this is what it was like in the past because it's such an active environment. This is just um, looking at the ocean basins again in a slightly more colored fashion. So you can see the seafloor spreading, spreading faster in the Pacific than in the Atlantic, which is why we have more of the younger ages, which are the, the age scales down here, it's sort of old in blue, medium in green, young in orange. So the young stuff is all associated with the ocean expression. And this, like I say, is a process that's continually happening. This is kind of a summary of our understanding of the timing of things. I just kind of put this in for, you know, whatever uh, historical sense. This is sort of how old people thought Earth was as a function of time, okay? Like the Greeks, and then when they started making sort of more um, precise calculations. So, so like there was um, this guy, Archbishop Usher, who you know made a calculation in the sort of very early Renaissance. He like took the Bible and he added up all the generations, right? And he's like, oh, look at that. Uh, Earth formed at 9 a.m. on October 26, 4004 BC. Right, and it took another couple hundred years before we started to get up to um, more realistic 
you know, calculations. This is still way too small, 100,000 years, but it kind of blows the Bible out of the water. And it came from sort of um, the cooling of iron from the molten stage. Just a bunch of assumptions which are actually probably not right um, to, to kind of make a core. And then various other kinds of physical things. And then finally, uh, discovery of radioactivity, curies, et cetera, and the application of that to dating the oldest materials of the earth, all happening sort of in the 20th century, getting us up to that kind of age, right? And, and since then, you know, all we've been doing is refining our understanding and finding materials that represent different periods of time in that overlapping condensation, accretion, core formation, crust formation process, right? We don't actually, when we get down to high enough resolution, expect to get one age for the Earth because it's continually happening. But the oldest rocks that we can find anywhere on Earth are, are almost 4.3 billion years old, right? These are these things that come, um, you know, I won't even try to pronounce this location, but it's, it's in northeastern Canada. There's some very old uh, rocks just across the bay or the ocean, I guess, in um, uh, Greenland as well. Okay, and these rocks, they're not, they're not basalts, they are something called greenstones, these are altered, metamorphosed basalts um, and volcanic clastic rocks that were formed from them. These were determined by the Sumerian Neodymium method, which we'll talk about later, but one like kind of important thing is these are refractory elements, both of them. Sumerian decays, uh, I still Sumerian 147, decays in Neodymium 143, and both of them, uh, because they're refractory elements, were you know in the early Earth's mantle um, undisturbed and tundra decomposition. Now the oldest materials on Earth are a little bit older than that. Okay, so older than those first igneous rocks, we find zircon crystals. This is just a false color image of the zircon crystal um, under polarized light. You can see it's got these layers. The way zircons tend to grow if they're in a magma is you just keep adding stuff onto them and they don't reset in the interior. And we can find zircons in continental settings that have been, they have, you know, age bands in them that can be span, you know, many hundreds of millions of years. The grain could have formed, been an igneous rock, that rock could have been weathered, it could have been incorporated into a sandstone, that material could have been metamorphosed, and more material could have been added to it at various stages. We even find zircons in volcanic rocks today in places like Yellowstone that um, that had a prior history. They were part of some rock that got incorporated in the magnet and more zircon grew on them. And we have methods, very precise methods of measuring the age of these things with uranium lead dating and um, a sort of laser or other laser-like methods that can bombard and eject um, elements from any one of these layers and we can get precise numbers from them. So at, as it stands right now, um, the oldest evidence for any grains on the planet are 4.36 billion years old. And it turns out, you can look at the oxygen isotopic composition of those things and the rarest composition um, uh, and various other things like the titanium and zirconium concentration ratio, which tells us about the temperature and the conditions. We think those grains may have seen some water so that we also feel there's liquid water by that point uh, on Earth. But these grains, Right, they are 100 million years ish older than these oldest rocks, like 80 million years older than these guys. But they're not in a rock that's that old, they're in a rock that's a lot younger, right? Uh, because the, they're in a sandstone. So those grains they formed, they went through their thing, they were in a rock, that rock got broken down and weathered, transported, deposited into a sandstone. That sandstone got metamorphosed. Turns out that. Uh, zircon can kind of see through that process. And so th these oldest grains are sitting in rocks that are much, much younger. But anyway, we have them. Um, and if we look back to that map, the colored map with all the areas of the oldest rocks, we have little bits of rock on each of the continents that's older than about 3.8 billion years old. So when we try to reconstruct what was the time history of building up the crust, how fast did we have it? How much crust did we have? And we're going to see in a moment, there's a lot of debate about what the pathway was to making uh, oceanic crust. But we know we had enough crust by 3.8 billion years, which is kind of coincident with the end of heavy bombardment on the moon, uh, plus minus 0.1 uh, billion years, um, that some of it is still preserved today, right? A lot of it got broken up and disaggregated and reworked in the rock cycle, but we still got some, okay? Um, and yet, 
there are very few really large areas bigger than, um, you know, older than about two and a half billion years. So we have some of this old stuff, but, you know, the first roughly half, almost half of Earth's history, we only have little bits of it. That's what that, that age map tells us. And so the proportion of those things is not a reliable indicator of how much was there in the past. So there's too much other junk going on with, you know, uh, the rock cycle along with plate tectonics. But this is a, you know, a slightly less fancy version of that same map showing the distribution of things. Uh, black and gray are the oldest. Black is especially the oldest. And this is now shown in uh, years instead of geological epochs. And um, so these areas I've circled in red are called the continental shields. They're sort of things that have managed to stay together as large coherent chunks of continental, old continental rock through all the coming together and breaking apart of the continents over the sort of plate tectonic cycle history of Earth. And these are the locations where we can kind of interrogate these questions about early crust formation. So um, another question we can ask is, so when do plate tectonics start, right? Because we only have it as far as we know on Earth in our solar system. Why did it start? How did it start? It's very important in controlling the distribution of our crustal types. That bimodal distribution comes from that, for instance. And so one of the things that we recognize is a sequence of rocks that we think are associated with plate tectonics are um, something called greenstone belts. And these are things that have slightly metamorphosed submarine rocks, pillow basalts, shirts, which represent um, altered sediments that were sitting on top of them, and granite-bearing conglomerates, which represent volcanic clastic rocks that were probably shed off of, for instance, a proto-arc. And so these things together are thought to represent early subduction zone remnants preserved, highly metamorphosed, but still preserved in uh, the rock record. And um, these are kind of evidence of this early um, Kind of at least proto subduction and formation of subduction zones. We also find some comadiites there, so we know that temperature was hotter than what we have today. And um, we find these in the rocks that are older than two and a half billion years. Um, so we know that at least by halfway through our history, you know, we had plate tectonics operating. But people still debate about you know whether every greenstone belt is can be interpreted as a subduction zone or not. Um, there isn't a lot of it left and it's been um, very altered. And, you know, when did this officially kick off in Earth's history? We still don't really know, right? But presumably, you know, things were starting to become kind of normal-ish by, you know, something like 3.5 billion years or so. So this is another, this is a diagram summarizing various people's idea about the formation of the continental crust. So we've got time coming over here. Today is off there on the uh, right to zero. Here's the formation of the Earth. And here's the relative percent of continental crust. Okay, So these are different people's models. F is a person, A is a person, B, H and R. right? And so you can see a wide range. Like F is like, oh, yeah, we totally made all of our crust really early on. We even made more of it. right? And then it's just been declining since then. And they have reasons for it. H and R has got this other idea. It's like, no, no, crust formation was really slow. At three billion years, we really didn't even have any crust. This is like a literal reading of, of uh, this diagram, for instance, right? Which is just like, yeah, no, we know that's not right. We know a bunch of this stuff has been, well, there was more of it in the past. But anyway, it's an end member. And what you'll see is that most of the models kind of come up the middle, right? And the way that this is done is by um, people kind of trying to, there's different sorts of arguments that go into it, statistical arguments about like, well, how much crust do we think is formed and lost per year in the plate tectonic cycle by kind of looking at a you know, more modern or recent part of geological record and then applying that to the past is one possibility. Of course, we don't know, plate tectonics could have been operating differently in the past if the mantle was hotter, things could have been faster, collisions, um, continental fragments could have been organized differently. So there's a lot of stuff that we don't know when we get into the deep past. There's various arguments as well. They come from radioactivity and radioactive isotopes and the records of crustal formation that they lead. Uh, so I'm not going to try and belabor this, but you can see that you know, some people feel like it was stepwise 
right? Some people feel like it was more smooth. This one here has a real inflection in it, has a real rapid growth of crust. Um, and, and people still debate this. I'm not gonna try to give you one, you know, for sure way, but this is for instance from a Scientific American article, um, you know, uh, that's now it's a couple of decades old. It hasn't really changed. That's one model that many people favor, which has kind of early crust forming, right? But because of all the early bombardment and stuff that didn't end until about here, uh, that it just kept getting destroyed and worked back into the mantle. And that early crust was probably not so continental. It was probably more like the crust that we find on Mars or on um, the moon, right? This kind of uh, creep in a North Pacific like composition. And if that was kind of happening and happening, and at the time of this thing, the oldest rock known was 3.96 billion years, big cast and nice. If you recall a couple slides back, I told you we now have an older rock. It's 4.28. Um, so, but this is just, that's the difference of what we've learned in the last 20 years. But in any event, they have this growth curve that basically, you know, things don't really start kicking in until about 3 billion years. And then there's a couple of major episodes. So this model incorporates some of this map too, right? Um, and so that ends up being kind of the, it went like the relative proportions of these different age domains and kind of saying, well, even if we think crust is produced and destroyed at a constant or roughly constant rate, um, how do we make the pattern that we see? Well, you know, that, those are the kinds of arguments that go into these various scenarios. And I think the key point to note is that we don't have much record of this early Earth history. We have little snippets of it. They tell us something about the conditions, something about the chemistry. Um, we can look at the other planetary bodies and um, Basically, the system that starts to look like what we have today with plate tectonics and the continental crust and oceanic crust appears to kick off. It takes a, a billion or a billion and a half years or so, right? And you can debate with people about, well, you know, they kick off here or they kick off there as per that last slide. But there does seem to have been a period of time where it, it took to stabilize um, the system before we started really accreting the uh, low density continental crust. So um, there's a couple of other so kind of the rest of this conversation now is about how do the various elements partition into the crust? And like I said, this will continue on in the next time. But it's important to recognize there's sort of three kinds of materials in the silicate part of the earth after the core forms that represent the uh, various components of the crust making process. So before we start making crust, we have something called primitive mass. Primitive mantle is basically the pyrolite model or some other model where we take chondrites, we devolatilize, we take out some core, and we're left with this rock, right? There's a, a debate, but most of us feel like that, I think, they say, say there isn't much of any primitive mantle left on it, right? For metal, you know, convecting and stripping this stuff off and distilling out a continental crust, an oceanic crust, there may be a little bit of it down there somewhere, but it's unlikely. So what's left after that? is when you start to extract a crust, whatever kind it is, it's an early proto-crust, or it's a late oceanic crust, or it's a continental crust, it leaves behind mantle that is depleted in the stuff that's now in the crust. So we call those depleted mantles, right? And there can be various processes that cause that depletion to happen, but basically the crust, or excuse me, the depleted mantle is the residue from making the crust. Now, in a complicated planet like we have with subduction and reintroduction of material into the mantle, we get a whole range of compositions from the process of putting stuff that's been up on the surface back down in. That makes these various enriched mantle reservoirs, which we will talk about later, but they're not part of this particular story. It's happening, we know what's going on, we know the mantle is stirring and we're taking stuff out and we're putting stuff back in. So we've got to kind of account for that. But if we want to look at the kind of process through which the crust forms, we want to try and make some really simple arguments about how much of these three Goldschmidt category elements are there. How much of the lithophiles, these are the elements that want to go into the crust, right? So they should be lower in the depleted mantle, the residue of making crust, than the primitive mantle, right? And the amount of depletion is going to tell us about the amount of crust that was taken out of that primitive mantle. We have the cinderphile elements, right, which we've talked about as well. This is going to help us understand did we start making crust before we made a core? In which case, many cinderophile elements are also lithophile, meaning 
that if there isn't a core or iron phase for them to go into, they're going to prefer to go into uh, the crust if it's formed. So we kind of want to look at the centerfile element abundances in the crust, in different parts of the crust, and we want to look at the chalcophile element. And um, so we look at both the major elements and the trace elements, and we look at how various samples of crust going all the way back in Earth's history record the composition of the mantle that they came from and can, did that change over time? Did the process of how we make crust change over time? Presumably the process has become cooler uh, as the planet has cooled, but what other differences you know, can we detect? So um, this is just a, a you know, table for the major elements, right? That show chondritic meteorites, Kind of average, not just your C1s, but across all the chondrites, Earth's mantle on average, and an average basalt on the planet, and the average granite. And I've highlighted the elements that are, you know, really rather different. Um, you know, iron, obviously, it's going to be different, but that's because of the core, so I've, I've kept it out of the mix. But the silicon, the aluminum, the sodium, and the potassium, right, these are volatile. They're telling us something about temperature. Aluminum is refractory. It should be really similar to um, chondrites and accretes to the earth, and then it doesn't um, you know, vary by very much. Uh, it doesn't go into the core, for instance, it's moderately lithophile. So it, some of it stays in the mantle, some of it goes into, into the crust as the crust forms. But you can see this big jump up in concentration between the mantle and the basalts. That's not because aluminum so much wants to go into those things, but it's because other elements don't, especially look at magnesium. So we look at chondritic meteorites, 12%. If we look at Earth's mantle, we think it's almost a quarter. But when we melt the mantle, right, when we make, melt it a lot to make basalts, maybe 10, 15%, this concentration goes way down because magnesium likes to stay in the mantle. When we look at a uh, you know, granitic continental crust, it's even lower. So the fact that the magnesium is so low is what makes the aluminum look, look higher in part. And you can also see a big difference in the iron, right? The uh, basaltic crust that we have on the planet that forms the oceanic crust is a lot more iron than the granitic crust. So whatever process is going on to make that low density continental crust is basically excluding magnesium and excluding iron. Again, it tells us about the mineralogy, it tells us about the temperature and pressure of the processes through which those magnets are made and produced. And, um, when we sum all these things back up, we can account for plus minus different reservoirs in the mantle in different volumes that must have been involved in making this stuff and this stuff and leaving behind a residue and how much of, of the mantle may still um, be like pyrolite model versus some other um, you know, variant thereof because of stuff being added back on. And these are just some summaries of some of the stuff on that on that last table that I just kind of walked through, so I'm not going to say it again, but um, some of the inferences we can make that when we're making crust, silicon is more lithophile than magnesium, right? Magnesium likes to stay in the mantle. Sodium, potassium, and aluminum are even more lithophile than silicon, and calcium is only reluctantly lithophile. So if you, if you look back to that last table, calcium doesn't vary by very much. Um, <clears throat> so then, then we have all the sort of non-major elements, the things that are partitioning into the mineral phases, but they're not really dominating the mineral phases. And we can sort of interrogate the oceanic crust and the continental crust for those. And what we find is that oceanic crust is more homogeneous. They're not homogeneous. Some people have the idea that it's all the same. It isn't. It's got variations in the trace element com composition, but it's a lot less than we find in continental rock. Because continental rock have a huge variation. So since we're at the end, I have some calculations next, which I'm going to just tack on to next time, where we can look at the behavior of some elements. But I'm going to stop there and ask if, um, if you have any questions.